go live. <coughs> That's, a, by the way, the new feature. Usually when I start streaming, it automatically goes online. Yeah, very good. Very good. Very, very good. Okay. You're happy? Yeah. I'm happy. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can do it. You can do it. It cut, it cuts a little bit. I'm gonna be like this a little bit. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You saw my gang from Malaysia, so there was a lot of new members in our gang. One, uh, we got to close today at uh, 140, 140. Um, I'm, uh, I still haven't had a lunch today. Oh, okay. I went to have a lunch. I tried to get had a lunch uh, at 11:45, but it was it was so crowded. I, I made a math that this is going to take just too long time, just a little bit too long time. But I, so it's either you guys in the lecture or me to have a lunch. So you guys comes first, of course. So I can I can manage without eating. <laughs> okay, hey, uh, happy to be back. Hey, and I need to apologize that the week ago there was a little bit of uh, problems. Uh, the problem was that uh, I was traveling, uh, and uh, the plan was that uh, Suras will be my substitute teacher, but he got the fever or something, so he did not feel well. Uh, so we decided that it's easier just to cancel it. The alternative would be that I could somehow try to use the material that was recorded a year ago. But I don't want to do it because every year we are going a little bit of different speed. And every year we're covering a little bit of different material, so it's not so convenient to you. So here we are. Today we're going to use this hour and um, 20 minutes, hour and uh, 25 minutes, roughly something like that, for closing the case of three-dimensional multi-body dynamics and while we are closing the case of three-dimensional multi-body dynamics we also gonna take a look at the robot kinematics something that you have heard about it something like Denovit Hartenberg have you ever heard about the method called Denovit Hartenberg method no okay so it's gonna be a just a short visit to um, robot kinematics because the robot kinematics is a cousin of multi-body system dynamics brother mother, I don't know, close relative for multi-body system dynamics and uh, how they are close related, how is the, the relationship, that's what we're going to learn a little bit later today. And this robot kinematics is something that if you take a look at, if you purchase a book about the kinematics, it's a great chance that this, is, uh, this book is covering not really multi-body system dynamics, but the robot kinematics. And you will see that it's not that far what we already know. But the presentation style, completely different. Completely different. Okay, so that's going to be the little bit of detouring we're going to do today. And then after today, maybe even later today, if everything goes as planned, we can start a completely new topic, which is this flexible multibody dynamics. And it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful topic because that's going to combine material you have perhaps learned from, I don't know what is the name of the course, but uh, in some of the, are you, are you familiar with the finite term method? You have heard about it. So where did you hear about it? What course you learned that method? What, what was it? Bachelor degree. So already you learn in a, in a, in a high school, right? Already a long time ago. Okay, so, but you know what's the deal with the finite term method. Idea is that you take your structure, you discretize your structure using small elements. And these small elements are representing the piece of solution. You combining this piece of solution, you can get the accurate solution. That's the, that's the idea. Uh, we're gonna take a look at this uh, finite term method. We can look how it is, uh, uh, what's the like inherent character of finite term method. And then we're going to take a look how that can be combined with multi-body system dynamics. And already this time, you know that we have a great challenge. 
the great challenge is the fact that typical finite term model consists of 10,000 degrees of freedom, 100,000 degrees of freedom, sometimes 10 million degrees of freedom. Whereas the multi-body models, they consist of 20 degrees of freedom, depending on the method we're using. But let's say that we're using method based on Lacrans multipliers, we can have 50 uh, <clears throat> degrees of freedom. Well, that could be the really, really, I mean, 50 unknowns. Whereas in a finite term method is uh, 10,000 times higher than that. And this big mismatch is something that we need to do something about it. And what we will do is called model reduction. So we reduce the model, as the title implies. How are we going to do it? That's going to take us in another space, which is uh, something you heard from Yussi Sopanen. And it's going to be the modal space. So we're going to move from physical nodal degrees of freedom to something that is a modal degrees of freedom. What they're representing us, that's going to be an exciting story. And it's going to combine your knowledge about <clears throat> Uh, vibration, mechanical vibrations, that's going to be coming very close to us. And um, multi degrees of freedom vibration systems, we're going to all take a look at that. That's how you can solve it by using a finite element method. So that's what's going to happen next. Prior to that, three dimensional multi body system dynamics. So this is a summary of what happened two weeks. Well, let me do the math. Three weeks back. Three weeks back because uh, Two weeks ago, there was an Arjen Schwab explaining things about the bicycle dynamics. A week ago, everything was canceled. So this was a three weeks ago. So we learned a little bit about the three-dimensional kinematics. And we learned that everything is not that much of a different that they were in a planner case, except dimensions are bigger. And big difference is that in three-dimensional space, uh, the, how you describing the body orientation is a big problem. And it's a big problem. And the big problem comes from the fact that if you, sell, if you decided to use a three parameters, you're going to have this problem with um, singularity. Now, I say that, that you know, there is no way to do this uh, using these three parameters and not to get the singularity problem. Maybe I'm not completely correct in that statement because there is something called Lee Krupp method. If you're typing on, if you, if you use a Google Scholar, you're going to take a look at the Lee Krupp. This is something that is based on three parameters and it's not really suffering from singularities. But as a general statement, it's, so, it's okay to say that three parameters are problematic because they're suffering from singularity. And one of the singularity problem is that if you're using Euler angles, you can get this gimbal locking, meaning that you're no longer able to differentiate what rotation is what. And that's simply because two axes of rotation becomes to be parallel. So you, you're losing your capability to recognize what rotation actually takes a place because they're having the same rotation axis. And that happens no matter what method you use. So that's why we make this choice. And we, I made a choice that we're going to take a look at the methods based on four parameters. Now, four parameters, very important to keep in mind that the body can rotate in uh, how many different ways? three ways. This is the physics. Body cannot rotate in a four different ways, but the three different ways, because there's a three axis that it can take a place of, of where the rotation can take a place. But we're using four parameters to describe these uh, three independent rotations, meaning that these four parameters are not fully independent, but they are related one way or another. Now, the one way they could be related is that, uh, you know, there's, if you're using this method based on this uh, Rotiquois equation, then uh, the, this one vector that it was used in a rotation is unit in the length. That's how things are related. We get back to that in a minute, but let, let me just first summarize this. So this is what we discussed about the Euler angles. Oh, by the way, you know, next week or just before the midterm exam, I'm going to make a little bit of a sidestep from the real topics, from the technical topics. And we're going to discuss about the topic related to your master thesis topic. Okay? Like it or not. Still, I wanted to do it. And I wanted to explain to you what, is you, what you should be aware of 
when you do this selection of master thesis topic. What are the different choices? And maybe if you have this big desire that you want to go to Finnish industry, what is a way to make that happen? And I think it, maybe I need to even do that next week because this is becomes to be a time that you contacting different companies and you're looking different career opportunities. What makes sense to do? Or what do you guys say? Should we have it next week or a week after that? Even later. Next week is okay. Okay, short short side visit. So it's not going to take too much time, but something that uh, that I wanted to explain to you. Then uh, there's going to be another one, which is a clear step away from the technical topic. Uh, that's the career counseling as a bigger picture. Bigger picture career counseling. If you want to stay in academia, if you don't want to stay in academia, what makes sense to do? Because, you know, we, you know, this thing, you know, if you can keep this in your private information, I do have this uh, dark history, meaning that I've been in industry too. But confidential, confidential information, not for private, I mean, the public information, because at the moment, it's such that if you make a selection of academia, it's hard to go to industry. Another way, if you go to industry, finding your way back to academia is uh, very, very difficult. What are these different things that is good to keep in mind? We get back to that. Any comments, questions so far? Clear. But you're willing to hear that. And I'm more than willing to share that information with you. My thoughts. Not clear facts. Ailer angles, you know the deal. So Ailer angles is something that... Uh, one more thing. My pen. Here. That is based on three parameters and it's based on three successive rotations. So you describe the rotation. Uh, uh. Okay, is it that, that this pen is not synchronized or, or why? Not willing to make any drawings. Okay, so we are, I need to make a, a little bit of different presentation mode, but you have a different rotations, three different rotations, first uh, around the z-axis, then once rotated x-axis, and one, two times rotated z-axis. Each of the rotations can be described by a three by three rotation matrix, and you multiply them together, you can get the final description. That's it. But it's suffering from this gimbal locking, and really makes sense to take a look at this, some of the YouTube uh, videos about the gimbal locking. Alternative, completely different concept is this. And concept, a completely different concept is where we're gonna take the vector, the bigger one, the longer, longer one, this one here, and then we're gonna take a, a, like assisting vector, which is a unit length vector V. And we're gonna set this assisting vector to any configuration you want with respect to this original vector, which is R. Then you're going to take a hold. So this is a configuration we have. You take a hold of this assisting vector. You introduce a rotation that is a mount of theta. And it's possible to put this original vector to any configuration in the space you want. This is a good example about the method that is based on four parameters. Where these four parameters are coming from, first of all, you need to get the three parameters to describe this unit length vector v. Is unit in length. And then the fourth one is amount of rotation, which is uh, angle theta. Angle theta here. And remember, there was this uh, skew symmetric form of the vector v. It's just a metric representation of a vector, nothing else. Why skew symmetric? Because some of the cross products are easier to deal with when you have this skew symmetric for. It's nothing special, it's very mechanical, very, very mechanical. You just take a component of your vector V, you place it in uh, the skew symmetric matrix where the diagonal components are equal to zero, and that's it, simple like that. So, four parameters, four parameters. That's how it goes, this is how the method is based on. Now, this is how the equation reads. So we can 
take a look at the, some of the numerical examples. That's going to be sometimes next week. Well, I'm going to introduce you some examples about this. But basically, this is a constraint because the components of vector V are not decoupled, but they are coupled because the vector V have to be unit in a leg. That's what it is. This is something that I'm in a couple slide I'm going to ask you in a in class quiz. Simple life. So I'm asking what is a that combines these uh, four parameters together and answer is because the vector V is unit in a length. Okay, this is clear so far. Everything is clear. Okay, so let's take a look. Ah, so there's a first in class quiz. So in rotation equation, rotation is described by four parameters. V1, V2, V3, and angle theta. These four parameters are coupled because rotation angle is small because uh, vector V is unit in a length, we are assuming a body to be rigid. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, it's not dead on. It's not dead on, but I'm gonna put it on momentarily. So just a second, I'm gonna, because I did not lock into this uh, socket yet, but I will do it right now. Socket teacher. Uh, Squeak quizzes, this one, teacher, lounge, uh, so, and it is on. And again, oh, you don't see this. Okay, so let me, um, let me display this is uh, in a way that I can, uh, Windows, Capture, Display capture, Windows capture. So I need to use a. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a visible. If I do like this, it's visible for for you guys, right? Just a second here. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Okay. Okay. Then there is a one more option which comes after the assumption that the body is a is a rigid uh, and it says that the parameters are not coupled because a body can rotate in a four different ways okay which one is correct we have 30 so here we have uh, seven students in a class eight in online so uh, what's that no, that's uh, that's not the right number. That's uh, I was adding the students of this class to the one that I used in last semester. So it's uh, that's not the right number. So I think in this class we have thirty something students uh, in total, thirty five, and then some late registration too. So that's uh, so forty max, not more than that. Okay, then. Uh, how long we should wait? Because now it's ultra low latency, so you, the online participants can hear my voice like almost immediately, within a five seconds delay. Are we good? You guys are already all good. You're able to lock in. So is it or is it not? 100%. Is it or is it not? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Remember what happened three weeks back? It was 100%. So what if this class is going to be 100% all the time? Could that be possible? Could that be possible? Then I would, I definitely will send an email to rector and say, hey, come on and participate in my, my lecture so you can learn some good stuff. Not about the, this uh, rotation, but the how well you guys are doing. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Where is my pointer here? Okay, so, okay, bad news. Uh, okay, only one of these options actually made sense. Rest of the uh, rest of these options has uh, uh, completely nonsense, completely nonsense. Because, uh, first of all, remember in a multi-body system dynamics, we never ever make this assumption that the rotation is small. We do. We, 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 never, we never look at the, th the world like that. So we are not never linearizing the world like that. 
even though when we're describing flexible bodies, we do. So we're making this exception. But generally speaking, we don't make this exception. Then their body is rigid, is nothing to do with the rotation. That's completely making no sense. And the, the last option is absolutely not making no sense because the body cannot rotate in a four different ways. That will change the physics. And we are not here to change the physics, but learn the physics. All right? Okay, but taking myself back to this one. This PowerPoint presentation, and I think that I use a different kind of a presentation mode because this is not allowing me to make any drawings. Ah, let me just take a look how this how this goes out. Nope, this is not the way. Or can I somehow maximize this one here? No. No, I don't think so. <clears throat> Display settings. Yep, here it is. This is perfect now. <clears throat> and I think that I may be even able to make some drawings here. Yep. So this, it, you guys still don't see this so well. Are you guys comfortable with this wind? Okay, so then we're going to use that. Okay. We started here. Okay. Now we're going to do something a, bit, a little bit different. But, yes, sir. No, it's uh, actually it's not. You mean this, uh, this Rodriguez equation? Rodriguez equation is not um, very much used because it's, um, there is a better option for it. And the better option is the one that I'm about to explain it to you. Uh, this is this uh, Euler parameters. Euler parameters is an um, extension from Rodriguez equation. But why do these, generally speaking, why these four parameters, like Rodriguez equation? Why it makes sense? It makes sense because then you're free from these singularities. And the singularity is a big problem because if you're hitting the singularity configuration, your, your simulation will fail. And you need to do something about it. And the one thing that is made in a commercial software is that you're continuously monitoring the condition of your rotation matrix using a rank. Because rank actually started to tell you that these two, uh, I mean, if the two rotation axes becomes to be close to each other, this is when you can see, okay, we mathematically are becoming to be close in a configuration that we cannot handle anymore. So they recognize it. And what they do then is that they artificially adding some angle to rotation matrix. And when they is using it, they take it away. So they artificially finding a detour around this singularity problem. Very inconvenient, not nice to use. And sometimes you can fail the simulation if you accidentally get started from the singularity configuration. You don't necessarily recognize that by yourself, but the computer is not just willing to cooperate with you. This problem can be solved when you're using four parameters. And these four parameters are called, I mean, the bigger family that they belong to is called quaternions. Now, if you take a look at the books about the rotations and quaternions, there's a lot of material related to rotations and quaternions. If you go take yourself to Amazon.com and you see how many books there is about the rotations and quaternions, there's a lot. Mainly because air space application. This is a big problem in space, of course, because rotation in a space, you have to be able to control that. But it's also a big problem of something that is considerably considered in a game technology. So most of the application, computer, computer vision, game technology, that's what, which is uh, very much uh, where it's being studied. A little bit about the multi-body system dynamics, but bigger family that it is, belongs to is quaternions. And the quaternions is free from the singularity. But the usability is not good because human brains is not trained to deal with the four parameters because there is only three rotations. This is what the human can understand. 
this is what the computers can understand. No, they don't match. They don't match well. And uh, the way you can solve this thing is that usually preprocessors, postprocessors, they moving from three to four to three. And they showing the only they use is these three ones because these are so pleasant to work with. This is used in solvers. This is what the computer loves. And it's uh, whenever you're making the solver, you started to use a four parameters. But the computer vision, game technology, coordinate neurons, rotations, hot. Well, I'm not sure if it is a hot topic, but it's still a matter of discussion. Now, alternative, a better way for Rodriguez equation is this, that you simply start calling the certain parameters of Rodriguez equation in a certain name. So it's a name game here. You start naming some of the components in a particular way. And when you do this name game, you get a little bit of different representation. Okay, what are the name games then? Well, first of all, so we're going to use is uh, this trigonometric functions to express our Rodriguez equation a little bit a different way. And now you see that there is becomes to be a little bit different components here. And now I started to call these components by these names. And these names are theta zero, theta one, theta two, and theta three. Nothing else. Now these four parameters are our Euler parameters. You know, the Euler parameters and their angles, name-wise, they're very near to each other. You know, they're almost like the uh, same thing, parameters, angles. How much they're different? Not much. But the concept behind is completely different. Because remember, Euler angles is based on successive rotations. Euler parameters is based on Rodriguez equation. Completely different game. Nothing to do with each other. Now, these four parameters are called like cosine theta divided by two. V1, the first component, the vector V sine theta divided by two. Second component, the vector V sine theta divided by two. And finally, final component, the vector V, then sin sine theta divided by two. Now, you're using these name games. This is how your rotation matrix below finally reads, free from singularities, but difficult to use. Because if I could give you four set of uh, Euler parameters, there is absolutely no way that you know what is the uh, orientation of the body. Human will not have that kind of understanding. At least I don't have that kind of understanding. Okay. So these are called Euler parameters. Remember, everything started when the vector v is a unit in the length, right? This is where everything started. This is still valid. Why? I'm going to take this off. Why it is still valid? Because if I take myself back to the previous slide, and I'm going to take, like, what is this uh, Euler parameters, where they are consisting of, you see the vector v is still there. So the unit constraint is still valid here. And now if you do this, if you look at how it is affecting, it is affecting exactly the same way. So if you take the, if you take a look at the, like, what's the length of these uh, Euler parameters, and you set that to be equal to zero, that's going to be your constraint. This is coming from the vector v, nothing else but the vector v. This is an alternative way to say vector v is a unit in the length, nothing else. Okay, so that's my uh, 3D kinematics. Properties of rotation matrix is going to be a brief topic, and then we're going to look at the robot kinematics. How that sounds. Anything else you want to discuss? Nope. Nothing. Okay. Um, let me, uh, can you please help me in a, so let's discuss about one subject matter. And is, uh, this is really your master thesis topic. So what is an instructions related to your master thesis topic? Because right now the Department of Mechanical Engineering is offering, I think, a total of eight different like specialization packages. Out of the eight, you need to select two. Now, what is an instructions regarding your thesis topic? It have to come from these two ones or not? The ones that you selected. 
So you don't, you did not get there in any inf information or any instructions yet. No, okay, okay. Let me verify this from Harry Eskelin, but it's strongly my opinion, and actually makes an awful lot of sense that if you make a selection of these two specializations, your supervisor must come out of these two specializations. Because what sense it would make that that you study a well that structures and uh, production engineering, and then you wanted to do the thesis that is not related to these two subject matters. Makes no sense. But again, you've got no instructions yet. So it's, you can say, no, we did not get any instructions yet, or what? You did not get any instructions. Okay, I think this is something we need to discuss because you're a little, not really in a hurry, but uh, this is a decision that soon you need to make. I don't know what is your plan for upcoming summaries. Are you pl are you planning to look some position in like summary job or you are? Are you looking for your summary job from other places than university? University. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense because you know, you need to apply a lot. You need to apply from many different places. University is just the one out of the many. Okay, but your maybe your summer work could be already related to your thesis work. It might, it might. Okay, I I promise, so let's get back to that. I was just curious to know if you got any instructions yet. Not yet. When is officially your time to get started in your thesis work? Next semester, or a summer, or a summer. Summer is a one option too, because you're expected to get your degree this time next year. No, this time next year. Okay, that's when you're gonna get the diploma and a hat. No hat, no hat, sorry, my mistake. So that's our only doctor degree. The master degree is just a diploma, right. And a cup of coffee. Very good. All right. The properties of rotation matrix is this. You know, you know that uh, because um, rotation matrix is describing coordinate system. The coordinate system is a clear example about orthogonal system. In three-dimensional space, it means that these coordinate axes are perpendicular with respect to each other. So they're independent. And because they're independent, when you construct a rotation matrix out of them, the rotation matrix will be orthogonal. Beautiful mathematical property because matrix inverse will be simply matrix transpose. Otherwise, it will be a big pain, big, big pain to compare the matrix inverse. But here you don't need to do that because again, these are coordinate axes and the coordinate axes are unit in length. So that's another thing, but it's not really helping much about this orthogonality. They could be longer than a unit, still they can be orthogonal. This is the only dimension, three and two dimensional dimension, where I can actually draw what the orthogonality means. But you can have a matrix dimension 10 times multiplied by 10 times, and it could be orthogonal. So meaning that your space size is 10 times unit. These vectors are still orthogonal with respect to each other. How it look? I'm running out of my fingers. I can then still 10 uh, by 10. Yeah, I still don't, cannot describe it to you, how it visually look. All right, so and you can verify this by changing the rotation order. And due to the orthogonality, it goes like this. Now, in three-dimensional space, you are not allowed to change the order of rotation. You are not allowed to do it. Because, and you can make an experiment by yourself. You can take a match box. And in the max, max box, you can draw the coordinate axis here. So, so let me, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but let's say that this is a X axis in a, in a length of the box. Y axis is a perpendicular direction, and this is Z axis, all right? So I'm gonna do the 90 degrees uh, rotations, first the X axis, and then the Y axis. This is my configuration. Okay, then I'm gonna do the same by first x-axis and then 
y-axis and then x-axis. There is not the same that it was. So they, you cannot change the order of the face. Not possible, because they will, they will represent the different things. Now, finally, robot kinematics. Now, robot kinematics, the questions are these, four by four. So we're going to start looking at something completely conceptually a little bit different. Four by four representation. What is this four by four? Uh, why they wanted to use it in a robot kinematics? Now, if you do, you, do you guys have the specialization called uh, intelligent machine? Okay, intelligent machine is a robot, a lot of uh, robotic this and that. One of the things uh, this and that is a robot kinematics. So you guys heard about this four by four already? Not yet. Exhibition. In, okay, okay, but not here in LUT. I think it is coming a bit later because it's so heavily used and it's a way to create the robot kinematics automatically, semi-automatically. You still need to do a little bit of thinking, but you can get the kinematics automatic. And l let me take a look what's, uh, what's, the, what's the case of this kinematic and uh, why, it is, why it is important. And now remember the kinematics dynamics. They are completely different story. This is what I hope you to already understand. Kinematics is what? Motion. Motion only. Dynamics, forces. They don't, I mean, of course they are related in a way that you have to have a kinematics to go to dynamics. But they are different thing in that sense. Kinematics is not the same as the dynamics. Kinetics sometimes is a, is a, you heard there, you know that you heard about the kin kinetics referring to dynamics. If I got the corners a little bit, but it's okay to cut the corners here. And this method we can learn is this, the end with Hardenberg four by four matrix representation. Kinematics is this. So if you know where each of these angles, what's the parameter or what's the, what's the, these, each of these robot angles are, where the end of the robot is located in three-dimensional space. That's called kinematics. Often this is not the big problem in the kinematics, in the robot kinematics, but the problem is that this particular configuration, this point here, if I think about just a point, this point can be reached in a number of different ways. And this is a, a big problem in uh, robotics. It called it's, it is called redundancy. And the redundancy is the fact that you can reach, like I, I, can, I can hit this mic this way, I can hit it this way, I can put it this way, easily. Why? Because I have so many joints, I have so many you know, ways that I can make it happen. So, and it happens automatically in the human body. And even if I make a, you know, a line like this, I don't get confused, I can make it easy like that, but I don't rapidly make it like this. But the robotics, uh, not as clever that I am, so they can make these kind of mistakes because they can, they have this possibility. All right, inverse kinematics is all about that we know where the end, if you think about this, our kinematic equation, where the R is located, but what about the rest? Where the local coordinate system is translated and what is its orientation, we don't know that. Of course, they are not fully free that we can choose because the robot is able to, if I take a single body of the robot, I cannot just move it as I want because it's connected to its neighboring bodies. So maybe not all of these parameters are free to move. Maybe it's just a one per body. But if you keep on adding these bodies, you have a lot of choices to reach one location, one point in the space. And this we'll be looking at, mostly we, that's what we're looking at in uh, robot kinematics. So we know this guy, but we do not know this guy or we do not know this guy. And uh, that's what we try to figure out, what they're supposed to be, that uh, we can figure it out. This redundant is the fact that the point can be reached in many different ways. I can put this pain in the same position many different ways. I'm redundant. My body is redundant. My hand is redundant. Okay? Okay. Uh, this equation describes bells in a robot kinematics, but 
when we look at the, these uh, inverse kinematics and robots, uh, robots in general, we need to do some modification to these kinematics we used to deal with. And this is where we're going to, or where I'm going to introduce you, these 4x4 four four matrix representations, very often used in a written exam. It goes like this. So you take these, all these components, and let me write this previous equation here one more time. So you're going to take each of these components and you relocate these components to matrix where the dimensions are 4 by 4. Okay, so you first create the 4 by 4 matrix. And then you take a hold of the R matrix here. And you can uh, locate the R matrix to upper right corner of your 4 by 4 matrix. No thinking. This is a similar kind of thing that skews your matrix, matrix representation. No thinking. Just do it. Just make it happen. All right? So that's your first relocation. Your second relocation is this. You take your 3 by 3. So this is 3 by 3. This was just uh, 3 units. You take this one here and you look at that in the upper right corner of your 4 by 4 matrix. Okay? And then what is left is just the one row. But because you want to have skewer matrix, you want it to fill this final row, and it's going to be filled by zeros and the diagonal component, which is, for some reason, which I don't understand by myself, is called scaling number. It scales, but I don't understand what we would the need to scale something. So if you put the bigger number than the one, everything that you will use in this kinematics will get bigger. But I don't understand why you would like to do something like that. If it is smaller than one, it becomes to be smaller. But Let's just agree that it can be, it needs to be one. So if it is one, this is it. This is your robot kinematics. It is representing one body in your system. And now the beauty of this kinematic is like pretty much what we did in uh, multi-body system dynamics. You can keep adding these components, four by four components together. And this is the way you can travel from one body to second body to third body the fourth body, and so on and so forth. So that's what they're representing. Now, if you then have a point that is not exactly where it is the origin of this reference coordinate system, again, you can use this vector u-bar that we discussed earlier, but this time the vector u-bar having a different name is called p. But the p is a function of the vector u-bar in a way that the vector u-bar components will be the first three components of the vector that are having the dimension of four, right? And that's it. Now, the point, this point here, you can get by multiplying this four by four matrix by B. Not convenient yet, but it becomes to be convenient when we look at the many bodies connected together. All right, let's make a short practice. Okay, here is a uh, coordinate system, the B coordinate system here, which is rotated 90 degrees with respect to global Z axis. And now we can create the um, rotation matrix based on this information. This is going to be representing rotation 30 degrees. And you see that this is where the axis takes a place. And then it is translated along the X axis, uh, 10 units along the X axis and Y5 units along the Y axis. So substituting that information here and that information here. You have four by four representation. And then the P is defined like this one here. So the P you're going to take, oh, this, by the way, is missing, he, uh, missing one here. So you take a P, you multiply that by this four by four, and the final configuration is here. Not very complicated. But again, the beauty is this. Now you have number of these uh, coordinate systems that are representing the bodies mm, or beams or components of your robotic system. So what you're going to then do is that you describe each of these uh, components of your robot system by a 4 by 4 matrix, and that allows you to travel from the root to where the end effector is located at. When you do that, you have the kinematics ready. No thinking needed. Bigger beauty. I mean, this is a one of the beautiful things. 
Another beautiful thing is this. Each of these, uh, I mean, neighboring coordinate system cannot typically free as they, they, uh, they cannot move as they want. But they can usually, you know, if you think about the typical joints in robotics, there is a, you know, revel joint. So that means that these two coordinate systems can only have one relative decrease of freedom. Or they may be translational joint. Again, one decrease of freedom. They may be, you know, some other type of the joints, but each of them can be represented simply by one decrease of freedom. And now, when we know that, we know that rotation between these bodies, rotation between these bodies, maybe rotation, be let's say translation between these, these two bodies, we can use these three parameters and we can get kinematics automatically. That's what this Denavit Heitenbach method is about. All right. So it's about the method that we are saying, okay, kinematics, we're going to just, just uh, take a few parameters, a few ways that the bodies can be combined together. And then we're going to use these a few parameters and we're going to get the kinematics automatic. All right. That's what we're going to do that. So how it goes, you know, these are the different opportunities. We can use a cylindrical joint, two variables, because, you know, they can slide like this and they can rotate like this. Revel joint is only can rotate like this. Translational joint, it only can translate like this. These are the three choices. Four variables, excuse me, two variables, one variable, one variable. Now I'm going to go back to this four by four representation. And now I'm going to describe this guy here, which is a three by three rotation matrix by using Euler angles. Okay. This is my Euler angles. I have here a total of six parameters, but I'm going to open just the one or two at the time. And that's going to be my Denavit Hartenberg kinematics. No, it was, I think I did the two weeks back, I heard something that I, that I think was, uh, was important. I heard that sitting an hour, uh, oh, by the way, so what are we supposed to do? Do you guys want to have a break or what? Because we are, it's about to have a break. And what I heard is that if you sit more than a one, one hour, one time, it's dangerous. Have you heard about it? That is dangerous. No, it's uh, something that, uh, I don't know why it is dangerous, but you know that you have heard that this, this thing that if you're sitting too much in your life, you're going to die early, at early age. Have you heard about it? What? You haven't heard about it. Yeah, it is true. It is true. So you should avoid to sit too much time, particularly sitting too much once, you know, one time. That's not good for your health. How? I cannot explain that to you, but you should stand up every now and then. So what do you guys say if we're going to have a short break and you, we stand up, we walk a bit, and we come back in uh, five minutes? Five minutes. All right. See you soon. You need to stand up. <laughs>
this airspace application, you know, is not clear with respect to what. You know, is it going to be because it makes no sense to, to measure with respect to, let's say, Earth? Because Earth could be, uh, you know, um, a long, you know, far from the point you are interested in. I think that's what makes it difficult. It's a little bit the same story than in, um, in like, in the vehicle dynamics, red road dynamics, which I hope that you're going to have a lecture a little bit later because the, that's a good example too, because in uh, vehicle dynamics, you have this very tiny motion when the wheel and the rail are interacting. You know, it's uh, like conical shapes that is uh, all the time hunting and changing a little bit. This is like a very tiny, this much motion, but it makes a difference in terms of ride, ride comfort. Same time, train can leave here from, from Lappeenranta, it can go all the way to Lapland. So now if you set your reference coordinate system to Lappeenranta, you're measuring what's going to happen in a lap in a Lapland, and you're measuring this tiny difference. You know it becomes to be very big numbers, very small numbers, and you know the computers they don't like that. They like either to have more small numbers or big numbers, but not simultaneously combination. So what you need to do is that you need to set the reference coordinate system somewhere in your train. Uh, where? Yeah, it is, I think that it is, but uh, then again, it's uh, maybe difficult because you have the small numbers and large numbers. That's a big job. So computer, this is, by the way, something we're going to get back. So it's called computers. It's like scaling, model scaling. So the computers, they really would like to put the numbers to near each other. So if you have very, very tiny numbers and very big numbers, that's, uh, that's a big problem to computers. It's a big problem to humans as well. I think that's what explains it. Nice that you ask. Are you become to be my friend? No? Yes? Hardly? Really? So you learn it. So, so where did you learn it? Journal. So you're reading journals. I know. I know. I know. Can I recommend you a good journal? Multi-body system dynamics. <laughs> I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> but you, so what journal are you following? Oh, okay. They have a lot of journals. So what particularly? In that uh, IEEE. Oh, okay. But I triple E, they have uh, not that many articles about the multi-body system dynamic. I don't think so. Not many. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> you know that there is a, this, uh, most of the sonars, they, um, once you look in the day website, they allow you to subscribe the staple of content. So every month they release a new issue, I, or I don't know, depending on the channel, how often they do it. You can get an email to your email account which uh, telling, okay, these are the latest papers. And this is how you can keep on track what happens in the science world. One way to make it happen. And of course, they are, you know, there are great, um, these uh, tools that can help you to find a good articles too, like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have heard about the, the Google Scholar. Google Scholar. And another one that is maybe even better than that is called Scopus. You know that database? And you can, you can log into the Scopus database by using LUT ingredients. So that, that's really handy. I, I like um, Scopus better than uh, Google Scholar because it doesn't matter what you type in a Google Scholar, like quaternion, special case, this and that always comes out with the five million articles, always. And it's, uh, you know, of course, uh, the most valuable ones are the ones that are ranked in a high. But then it comes with a lot of papers that have very little to do with the topic you're searching. Very little. Let me, let me make an, uh, let me see what happens if I type here, if I take myself to Scholar, Google Scholar, Quaternions, 
quote the neons. Okay, quote the neons. And rotation sequence. Okay, maybe this is, I'm not sure about, maybe this is already, quote the neons and rotations. 52,000 articles. Okay, that's a lot. That's, that's maybe too much. But that exactly is a problem in a, uh, Windows capture, display capture, this one. This is what I would like to show you. This is exactly how showing the, what's the problem in a Google Scholar. Too much material because some of them are important, but many of them are not. And one thing that, of course, you can narrow this. You can say, okay, only ones that are published after 2022 helps. But maybe there is something that is very valuable, lot, that is a lot to be used in a community. So you may skip that. So this is giving in a usually in an order that are mostly cited. And now this, you can see, this is written in Finnish because my settings are in Finnish. But this says how many times this has been uh, used, cited, in other studies. This is the way, if you know, this is published in 2008, already 15 years ago. So you can see what are the articles that are recently using this material by clicking this one here. Okay, then you see, okay, this has been... Uh, well, you see that it's been used last year and so on and so forth. So you can kind of get back to the today's, what happens today. That's one way. This is uh, one of the tools that you need to start using when you're doing your thesis work. Very important to use this in a very beginning. Because, uh, well, I think you need to take a look at the full picture because there are some, you know, there are good developments that are made already a long time ago. When I was young, that time, <laughs> even even earlier than that, believe me, there are a lot of books and other material that are very valuable. So you need to be aware of the big picture. You need to see what's going on, and there could be something that is used as a as a really the fu fundamentals of one particular subject matter. You need to be able to find it. Now the horror story is this, and it I don't know if it really happened ever like in a full scale, but in a minor scale it has happened. That, you know, there's something that is uh, not so nice to do is a good literature review in your thesis work. So you go, the, you go to university library and you look around a little bit. Okay, it's, there's a lot of books. Maybe this is okay as my literature review already. So maybe it's just like, to say, okay, checked, made it. And then you start doing whatever is your thesis topic. But then your supervisor insists, you must do your literature review. But you're, I don't know, it's like a waste of time because nothing going to be found in this particular subject matter, that finally your supervisor convinces you to do it, and you do it, then you can find something that is exactly like your thesis, but better. Very unfortunate, because the value of your thesis just collapsed, and it's not so big anymore. So you need to be aware of these things, so you need to be aware of what happened. And now it's not good, good explanation that there's nothing published. I don't believe it. I simply don't believe it. There is, if there is a topic you made in this university, for sure there is a material published, for sure. So if we top typing something like ultra, uh, I don't know what could be the really, really rare topic. Still, there's a lot of papers in that that particular topic. Something like, uh, well, let's take a look. Like how many how many papers are published in a railroad? Um, Rail, oh, this is in uh, mis railroad. Mm, what could be something? Vibration, railroad vibrations. Uh, so I want to like this. So it's uh, 45,000 articles, quite many. About that vibration, think about it. So what could be even narrow topic than that? If you give me, give me an example, so still there is a lot of material. So this is good to keep in mind. Back to this. What was uh, the mode that I use? I use this one here. Uh, no, not this one. But what, what was it? I, I used something that it was very good. Um, what, what was it? Notes. So use notes, like this one, no. I 
think this is okay. This is the only the only problem here is that I cannot make any drawings here. But other than that, it's okay. Okay, back to uh, Dana with Hartenberg. Now, Dana with Hartenberg is uh, based on a limited number of parameters. And there is only four different cases that this is capable to describe. But believe me or not, robots, practically all of them is enough. You don't need more than that. So it's simply meaning what are the different, uh, like uh, change the ways that, that the bodies can be, or the one, when the one, this reference coordinate system is located and capable to move with respect to another. That's all, nothing else. Let's get started from something simple. So let's get started from the, you know, something that we describing, uh, this is, you know, the picture, I need to uh, see if I can make this a bit bigger. So I'm, I'm translating that, I'm simply describing that how far from two coordinate systems are from each other. And this is described by using this parameter. So this is uh, this tiny parameter here, <coughs> excuse me. I need to change my presentation mode one more time. <clears throat> Was it this? No, no. Display settings here? This one? No. This one? Was it? I think it was this one. Was it not? Because then I used something here. No. What? What was it? So there was a. No, this is not the way. What about this? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. So one more. So. I don't remember what I did, but it was really good. I just don't remember that anymore. But let's just use uh, this one here. Now the problem is that you see where it is located, but the online participants they don't. You know the A, that the first parameter is telling how far from these two neighboring coordinate systems are located with respect to each other. The first parameter is A here. Put it in a really small font here. You don't even see it here, but it's this one. What's this distance here? Okay. So if you need to measure this distance, so what you can do, this by the way, typically is not the variable, but is a constant component in your math. So what you can do is that you can uh, set each of these rotational parameters to be equal to zero, because no rotation takes a place. And then you look at this uh, translational component, each except the one have to be set to zero. So the one that is not set to be zero is the one that is describing the length in terms of x-axis, because exactly what it is mentioned in the text here. All right, so what do you do then? So taking these six parameters, you substitute them to this equation. What you're gonna get is this one. So here's your parameter. This is the one value that is used, others are set. This is the only one you can modify. Then using the same principle, you are looking at the other parameters. Next one, obvious one, is what about the angle? This one here. This angle is, by the way, not this one, but the one that is alpha here. So let me take a look where is uh, angle alpha. So this is the one. Where is angle alpha? Theta. Okay, so it's the one that uh, shows how much these uh, two axes are tilted. So if they are in a line, so this will be equal to zero. If they are 90 degrees like this, it will be um, p divided by two. So that's the second component. Now this is related to rotation. Each of these six components except the one are set to be zero. And the one that is not set to be zero is this theta here. Because look at again what it says, angle about the common normal from the old axis, new axis measured with respect to x. This is exactly what the second component in the angles are representing for us. We're going to take the component, that's it. No further thinking, substitution, and it's like this. This is it. You know where this is taking us. So once we're multiplying these each of these notations together, we have a full representation. Third, so we're going to take uh, distance 
between x and x plus axis measured along the z. This is the one that is non-zero. Others are zero. So this is this length here. So you're gonna you're gonna substitute then, and you're gonna get our third component. Final one is a rotation, which is uh like how much how much. Uh, oh, by the way, I need to apologize that these these figures are not matched with these explanations. If you take a look at the the explanation, is yeah, it's this one here. This is that is song. Sorry that they are somehow mixed. But anyways, you do these uh, four parameters. Each of them are representing here. And once you multiply them together, here's your final four by four representation. How this actually work then? So how is that you can actually use this Denovit Hattenberg representation? It's gonna be the one that I'm gonna explain to you next. This is how it reads. And you know where they are coming from. Now you have four parameters you can select for each of these um, bodies of the robot. And once you do that, and once you multiply these uh, three by three, four by four matrices together, you get the final kinematics. It's simple like that. Only challenge here is that how to find these four parameters, that's where you need a little bit of thinking. And that's why I call this semi-automatic. You figure it out the parameters and rest is a downhill. So then you just do the multiplication and that's all you need to do. Let's take a look at an example. So I have here a double pendulum, which is a simple robotic system consists of two moving bodies. And these two moving bodies, you know, they are, oh, I cannot make a drawing, sorry about that. So th you see how they are. So there's a body number one and body number two. Each of these bodies have a length, which is a L1 and L2. Body one is uh, moving with respect to crown with the angle, which is theta. And that the relative uh, rotation between the two bodies is angle, I mean, theta two. What are you going to do next? Is that you're going to make a table that is located, located here in upper right corner of the slide. So you look at the number one body, number two body, and you're selecting these four parameters. The first was a length. Okay, what's the length of the first body? Given in the picture, that's going to be L1. Same for second body. What's the length of the second body? L2. Then you take this, how much they're twisted. You know, how much they are away from this planar line. They are not away from the planar line. So this is uh, zero, zero. The D, which is like how much they are off from this direction. That too is zero. So no need to put anything here. And the final one is this relative uh, co relative rotation. Theta one, theta two. All right, you're building the first one for the, the, for the first body. You do the second for the second body. You multiply them together. This is it. So what you're gonna get is that this is gonna show your final orientation of the end effector. This is gonna show the final position of the end effector. This is how simple it is. This is a kinematics semi-automatically made. Kinematics semi because table you need to do, rest you do automatic. Pretty effective. But what do you say? Is this something you, you feel that is a making sense or not making much of a sense? Semi-sense. Okay. All right. So that's a den of it, Hartenberg. And now I do the same. I just want to convince you that, okay, this is correct. So I'm computing the same by using multi-body system dynamics, which is this equation. I'm not going to repeat this in details to you, but I'm going to get the exactly same solution. Harder to use, much harder to use, because then you can get started with a lot of parameters and it becomes to be messy. So, uh, so it's not so easy to use. And this is two bodies. This becomes to be equally, I mean, increasingly complicated more you're adding bodies. Whereas uh, the other one is becomes to be increasingly simple. All right, final short topic that I'm gonna spend 10 minutes is uh, about the three-dimensional multi-body dynamics. Like really, the, what's the big problem? Or what's the big thing about the three-dimensional dynamics? Not the big difference because it's almost the same than in the planar case, but I want one of you to take a look at this rotation thing and how these, uh, 
angular velocity is not the same than time derivatives of rotational parameters. Not necessarily. I mean, they're never same. They're never same. But how they can be much to be same, we're going to take a look at that. Okay. So, these are the, this is a big, very difficult question. How inertia tensor can be uh, related to acceleration of rotation, rotational generalized, generalized, how rotational generalized rotational corners, that's a type of mistake, sorry about that. But anyways, inertia tensor, that's the one question. I think there was another one too. No, that's not the one. Okay, that's the, the what I'm asking here is this. You know, inertia tensor is the one that consists of uh, mass moment of inertia and mass product of inertia. Mass moment of inertia are located in a diagonal terms of the of the inertia tensor. You know this already, right? Mass product of the inertia is located off diagonal term, terms of the of this inertia tensor. Size of the inertia tensor is a three by three. Now, what if you're using four parameters in your computation, how you can match three by three to four. This is a mismatching case like we usually have in a multi-body system dynamics. But how you do the matching? And this is, uh, the answer is that there is this magical matrix T that is relating these things together. And using this T, you can use any parameters you want in your computing and still have something that makes sense that are easy to represent for human. Inertia tensor using body coordinate system is easy to understand. Very difficult to understand if you say, tell me the mass moment of inertia with respect to four error parameters. Almost mission impossible. Inertia, uh, mass moment of, uh, mass product of inertia, same thing. It's gonna be very, very hard to do it. So we're using this back and forth by using something that is called T matrix. That's an answer for this complicated question. You got it already or not yet? Absolutely not yet, because, uh, you know, uh, and you can be honest with me, because we we playing in the same team, you know that? So if we are teammates, you need to let me know, because uh, if you don't get it, just let me know. Okay. Okay, so we're, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I'm going to explain. This is a little bit long story, but let me try to, Speed up with this. Take a look at the video and uh, but don't do it in the evening. Don't do it in the evening because you're gonna fall asleep. And maybe never gonna wake up. Maybe. It's dangerous. Okay. All right. Here it goes. So we gonna go. Uh, we gonna speed up here quite a bit, and then we stop when I, when it becomes to make sense. But you know. Everything is same that in a planar case. So we're going to take a look at the first, the particle velocity. We're going to take a look at the acceleration. They're not that much different. So they're all the time the same business. But there is something that we need to keep in mind. And something that we need to keep in mind is this thing. That when you look at the velocity of the particle, you can get it by, by differentiating the vector r with respect to time. Translation of velocity. Then you do that for vector u bar. That's going to be equal to zero because the body is rigid. What is left is this one here. And now when you differentiate the, the rotation matrix with respect to time, you will get the angular velocity with respect to global coordinate system or body coordinate system, depending how you want to do it. But this is not the same that I'm using as my Euler angles. Not at all. This is a different story making things quite a bit more complicated than in a planar case. Okay, this is how you can read your velocity. And if I now go and take a look, what is the big problem here? The big problem is this. Angular velocity is never the same that you want you wanted to use in a generalized coordinates. Because generalized coordinates are the ones that are describing the translation and rotation of the body. Remember that. This is Euler angles, Euler parameters, but they never same than angular velocity. Okay, problem? Yes, that's a problem because computation, when we do the computation, we don't want to use this guy because this is not the unknown. The unknown is generalized coordinates. 
and they are Euler angles, Euler parameters, but not this guy here. So I want to explicitly see what is my unknowns. So I need to find the relation between this guy here and my unknowns. And this relation you can find by using something that is, that is called T matrix. T matrix, of course, depends on what kind of rotational parameters you're using. If you're using Euler angles, they are different than Euler parameters. Of course, because even the dimension of this guy will be different. In case of Euler parameters, this will be actually having uh, different dimensions. So it's a four by three. In Euler parameters, this is three by three. Again, so it's heavily case dependent. Not case, but dependent what kind of rotational parameters you use. By the way, Remember in uh, the simulation of mechatronic machine, I said that you never ever in your master thesis career, you're, gonna, you're never going to find as complicated material than, I think that I said, the virtual displacement. I was not completely honest with that, because this is more complicated than this. You started to think about heavily, like, what is this thing? You're going to develop the big headache, migraine even. I don't know if you're suffering from migraine, but you will if you start thinking this heavily. Very, very complicated thing. Oh, but but, but not, let's, let's not stay here. This is how the T-matrix looks in the case of Euler angles. They're telling you the rotation sequence because the first one is Z. Second one, if this angle, angle is here, zero, this is going to be one, zero, zero, X. And if this is, uh, this both angles are zero, this is going to be zero, zero, one. Z-axis. This is your T-matrix, and that relates these two things together. Now, finally, you can express your equation of motion by using unknowns, which is not the same than angular velocity. All right, and the T will be the one you use to map your inertia tensor to whatever parameters you wanted to use, whatever unknowns you wanted to use. That's the answer to the question we looked a little while ago. So with help of the T, you can use any unknowns, set of unknowns you want. You can still express your inertia tensor by using local body coordinate system, body local coordinate system. All right, and let me see. I say the most about that we're going to... Ah, okay, okay, so this is going to be difficult. T matrix is important because it couples the local and global coordinates. Well, let, me, let me explain this to you couples the angular velocity vector and the time derivatives of generalized coordinates. Describe the inertia properties of the body, couples the global and generalized coordinates. What do you guys think? Do you think that you can answer this already with the knowledge you have at the moment? Or not yet? You're looking at each other, you would you like me to go back? You feel comfortable, you feel confident. Let's, uh, should we try? And we can redo this uh, next week if this is not going to be a big success. Okay? All right, so let me take myself uh, the Socrative. And in, um, within, um, well, very soon you will see the Socrative result. Uh, Socrative is here. So I'm going to go to the next one. Okay, so it's again like uh, T-matrix is important because it couples the local and global coordinates, couples angular velocity vector and time derivatives of generalized coordinates, describe the inertia properties of the body, couples the global and generalized coordinates. Remember what couples the global and low, uh, and uh, Local coordinates, this is a virtual displacement. Back and forth. That's a hint to you. It leaves you two choices. No idea. Now you have no idea, right? Or you have an idea? Between two options. Two options. And what are the options you're between? You are not going to tell me. 
Why? If we're in the same team, you know, in a teammate, they, they pass the ball. They are, this is how they play, right? But you don't pass the ball to me, right? Huh. So is it that I'm not the good team player or, or something else? Ah, okay, so. Okay. Sorry that this is this is going to. How can I get this rid rid of this thing? This uh. Okay, okay. So we have what, how many answers we got last time? I think it was uh, pretty much this much, sixteen. So let's take a look. Very nice. I'm I'm impressed. I'm impressed because I was thinking that the success rate will be roughly what we can statistically get. 25 percent much higher than that ah much higher than that and uh, the number is a 65 okay we get back to this i'm gonna uh, so what i need to do here is that um because i have one more meeting that i need to go so i need to wrap up today a bit earlier five minutes earlier that i was thinking uh, and uh, this is uh, this took me the completely wrong location in my slides and then I will, what will happen is that we're going to have a couple more slides about uh, what's the deal with these uh, this kinematics, and then we're going to summarize the inertia tensor and how it is related to any unknowns you wanted to use. We're going to close the case uh, next week, and then what? Flexible bodies. And then what? Master thesis. Was it next week? Master thesis? Yes, next week. Master thesis topic how you can select it by the way one more thing that are you guys aware of the website called um, okay so so complicated that you don't recognize if i pronounce it but it's called have you ever heard it yeah it's so lengthy that there is no way that you can even type that correctly but is this one There. This one, this is uh, the really the good place that you can start looking your, where is my mouse? So this is where the all the companies are, are let you know that, okay, what are the open positions available? Now this is something that I highly recommend you to take a look because now the problem is that the right now is in uh, Finnish, but I'm gonna switch this in English. Okay, this okay. This is uh, now the tech is something that is not what I wanted to take. Uh, this one in English. This in English. Workbook. Okay, the workbook. Career planning, job choosing, documents. Let's take a look at that. Finding jobs, make myself visible. Uh, these are, let me see. Okay, not uh, career services, social media. I think it's because there's supposed to be recruiting events. There's supposed to be a list of companies and how you can actually get into, how is it you can send your application to these companies. I need to take a look at this by myself to be able to, to guide you better. We get back to this. Take a look at this in uh, before the next week uh, lecture. So it's going to be on Tuesday at noon. All right. Very good. And Mustafa is here uh, saying me, okay, let's go home. Let's go home. But I'm, I'm saying let's go home because I need to have a lunch now. If you want to have lunch, then play, play can miss. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the nice way because uh, you can get all the load to your chest. Okay. Hey, guys. Thank you very much. And we get back. And, uh, come, please come back next week because I promise that I'm going to discuss about these nasty things about rotation, this and that, but more about flexible bodies and what's the role of the finite settlement method, how it, what makes sense in terms of finite settlement method, a little bit about nonlinear finite settlement method, that kind of stuff. All right. Hopefully see you hopefully see you on uh, Tuesday. Okay.
Thanks. Uh, this is it. End of the stream.